Hey class, let's get started with our discussion on infectious diseases that affect the human body. So we really need to, when we look at infectious diseases, we're really going to need to focus on how the microbes that cause those diseases are going to interact with us. There are diseases that affect human beings that are not caused um, by microbes. Those are non-infectious diseases, and those are usually going to be congenital or genetic in nature. But some diseases are associated with some kind of a pathogen or microbe that makes us sick. These microbes that make us sick, or microbes in our environment, are just very abundant. If we look at the number of microbes in our bodies, and the number of microbial cells, and compare that to the number of human cells in our body, we actually have about 10 times more microbial cells in our body compared to human cells. In other words, most of the cells in your body are bacterial cells. And that's kind of creepy, particularly if you're a germaphobe. Now these microbes aren't all bad. Actually, most of these microbes are quite good for us and we use them to do many great things. We can make food products from beer to wine to cheese to sauerkraut. We can even use these microbes to make drugs, particularly if we genetically, uh, genetically engineered those microbes. We also use the microbes in our environment as decomposers that help us to recycle nutrients through the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. And then finally, those particularly irritating, those nasty buggers, those microbes that make us sick, those guys are known as pathogens. A pathogen is a microbe that makes us sick. So what makes up the microbe? A microbe is anything that is going to be microscopic, so we can't see it with our naked eye. We can't, it's not going to be gross or large in scale. And they can include any kind of bacterial cells, a virus, a prion, or other or single cellular or multicellular parasites that are still microscopic in nature, such as a fungus, or we can have some multicellular parasites that are typically going to be helminthes or parasitic worms. And then finally, we have single cell pro protistins or protozoas. Generally speaking, the multicellular guys are the largest, and then we'll go to the single celled fungi or protistins as the second largest, and then bacteria and then viruses, and then prions. Where prions are the smallest, viruses are the second smallest, and bacteria are the third smallest in size. Now, if we look at the size of our a typical human cell, this is a generic or typical eukaryotic cell. It's going to be quite large compared to a bacterial or prokaryotic cell. And a virus is even smaller. A virus is typically only going to be the size of an organelle within a typical eukaryotic cell. So these viruses are quite tiny in nature. What makes up a bacteria? A bacterium is going to be a prokaryotic organism and it's going to be single cellular in nature. When we say prokaryote, that's another term that means it does not have a nuclei and it does not have membrane bound organelles. Almost every single bacteria has a cell wall and because they have these cell walls, they have a lot of structural integrity to their single celled existence. All bacteria will have their genetic information stored in terms of DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid as one large circular chromosome that is going to be isolated in a region known as the chromatid region. There are bacteria that do have ribosomes. Ribosomes are a tiny organelle that we use to make proteins and these ribosomes are not membrane bound. So when I say bacteria do not have membrane bound organelles, they can have ribosomes because ribosomes don't have a membrane encapsulating them. So every once in a while, our bacteria are going to have a little tiny piece of accessory DNA. This tiny, smaller piece of DNA that's much smaller than the large single chromosome they have is called a plasmid. And you could think of the chromosome as a giant loop of DNA, and the plasmid is just a little tiny loop of DNA. All bacterial cells are going to reproduce via, via a process known as binary fission, which is essentially splitting down the middle and splitting in half, budding, in, and that binary fission process will have two daughter cells that are nearly identical. There's always going to be a few genetic differences, a few mutations that occur, but these two daughter cells are, for all intents and purposes, are going to be identical to the original parent cell. So here we can see a diagram of a bacterial cell. This bacterial cell has its DNA in the nucleoid region. So that dark purple line represents the large piece of DNA that is the circular chromosome. That lighter pink ring is the plasmid. And this bacterial cell has a plasma membrane 
and it has a cell wall. Something else that's notable about bacterial cells is they also have a capsule. Capsules are gel-like coatings that go around the bacterial cells and make it difficult for us to destroy the bacterial cells. Bacterial cells can also have sex pili to exchange genetic information. They can have cilia that they can infimbrae. The fimbrae allow for adhesion to surfaces, and if there are large numbers of cilia, those cilia can allow for the bacterial cell to move. And then finally, bacterial cells can also have flagella, or flagellum singular, for locomotion. Bacterial cells come in a variety of sizes. They can be spherical or cocci. They can be rod or bacilli shaped. And then finally, they can be spiral or spirulet in shape. A virus, unlike a bacterium, is even smaller and it's non-living. It is not a cell. The smallest living thing is going to be a cell, by definition. And since viruses are smaller than cells, they don't possess all of the organelles needed to reproduce on their own, viruses are considered non-living. They are a non-living obligate parasite. What do we mean by obligate? We mean that they have to exist as a parasite. They cannot exist on their own. They must reproduce inside of a host cell that they've reprogrammed. Since our viruses are acellular, I'll emphasize again, they don't have any cells, they are considered non-living in nature. Every single virus is going to have some genetic information in it. The genetic information will be stored as DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, or RNA, ribonucleic acid. And this genetic information, these nucleic acids, are going to be encapsulated in a protein shell known as the capsid coat. Sometimes the DNA and RNA will be double-stranded. Other times in viruses it can be single-stranded. And this is one of the few exceptions where you'll have, or few times where you'll have double-stranded ribonucleic acid, or double-stranded RNA, or single-stranded DNA. Occasionally viruses will have a cell, an envelope. This will be a layer of lipids that go around, or that is superficial to the protein capsids. And viruses are going to attach to very specific cells and enter in them, and they are going to use surface cell markers to determine what cell they attach to. So here's a nice generic adenovirus. This generic adenovirus is going to have a protein coating called the capsid that makes up the majority of its body. Inside, we have genetic information, and then there are fiber proteins, or fibers, that stick out from the capsid. And those fibers are used for docking. Those fibers determine what cell types the virus can fuse with and attack. And then finally, we have prions. Prions are infectious protein particles. It's not even the size of an organelle. This is one protein molecule or protein molecule that is a pathogen all by itself. These prions, generally speaking, are going to be located in the nervous system. Most prion-based diseases are diseases of the nervous system. And what happens? We have, to propagate a prion-based disease, we have the infectious protein particle come in physical contact with a non-infectious protein particle. And when the infectious prion comes in contact with a non-infectious protein, it causes that non-infectious protein to be morphed, change shape, it denatures and becomes an infectious protein. It becomes a prion. So prions can be self-propagating in that whenever they touch a non, the correct non-infectious protein, they can convert that non-infectious protein into a prion. And by changing their shapes or changing their conformations, these proteins go from non-infectious to infectious and propagate the disease. So, class, concept checked. Which of the following is the smallest infectious agent? Is it a bacterium, a prion, a virus, or a protista, or a single-celled protist? If you don't know the answer, that is okay. You can go ahead and rewind the video, or you can check your notes, or you can check the PowerPoint. Go ahead and pause the video and get me an answer right now. One, two, three, four. All right, class, hopefully you got prion. Prions are the smallest infectious agents. On this list, protista are the largest. They are eukaryotic infectious agents. And then bacteria are the second largest. Viruses are the second smallest. And then prions are the smallest infectious agent. Moving on, let's move to, on to section 8.2. As we look at infectious diseases, it's important that we know how to categorize and study these diseases and how to organize the information we collect about the disease. The study of a disease in a population of individuals is known as epidemiology. An epidemiologist is going to focus on 
um, things such as what time of year the disease is common, how the disease spreads, what locations, what physical locations have lots of, the, of, the, of a specific disease or have hardly any of the specific disease. They spend a lot of time overlaying disease information with global information systems or GIS information to try to find common trends or correlations. Infectious diseases are any kind of a disease that's caused by a pathogen. Um, this, is, this is the basis of an STI versus an STD. And the difference between an STI and an STD is primarily semantics. One's a sexually transmitted disease, one's a sexually transmitted infection. An infectious disease, generally speaking, can include the STD slash STIs. And these are going to be, and many other categories of diseases as well. And they can be caused by a wide variety of things. They've been caused by those single cellular bacteria or protozoans. They can be caused by multicellular parasites, single cellular fungi or multicellular fungi. Non-cellular viruses or protein particles known as prions can cause infectious diseases. If we have an outbreak of an infectious disease that has caused more diseases than we expected, over a certain poorly defined period of time, that is known as an epidemic. Um, recently in the Midwest, we had a swine flu epidemic. Um, and there were many more people that came down with swine flu than we initially expected. Generally speaking, epidemics are going to be either large scale, so they're gonna cover a large category of ground or a small category of ground or area of ground. Anytime you have more people contract the disease than you expected, that's known as an epidemic. Now, if that epi epidemic is localized, we refer to that as an outbreak. So you could think of it as being related to, um, relegated to a state within the United States. That could be an outbreak. But if we start to have it go spread to multiple countries, or more particular, more specifically, multiple continents, it goes from an outbreak to a ep a pandemic. Pan being a root word that refers to the to the globe. One disease that we're currently suffering from a pandemic from is human immunovirus, or HIV. HIV is believed to have originally inter, um, formed in primates. Um, and these primates have been, are believed to have contracted this disease, and this disease is believed to have mutated sometime in the late 1950s, early 1960s, and then spread to human populations in rural Africa. The exact first date of this time is still being investigated. There's a lot of uh, anal analysis right now that's looking at the rate of molecular change within the virus or the molecular clock to back to track to determine when did the mutation occur that allowed it to infect human beings. The first confirmed documented case of HIV AIDS in the United States was in 1969. And as recently as 1983, 1984, um, HIV was found to be the cause of AIDS. HIV is human immunodeficiency virus. AIDS is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. It's possible for someone to contract HIV and not necessarily have AIDS. So let's look at AIDS. And here's some current data on it, or it's relatively current as we can get. Um, world, globally, there's about 34 million people living with AIDS. And of those 34 million, not all of them have AIDS. Um, of those that have HIV, to give you some perspective, um, almost 1% of the global population of adults, almost 1% of adults in the world have HIV. So this is a currently incurable disease that has infected 1% of the global adult population, approximately. And this disease is still spreading very rapidly. If we looked at how many people died from HIV AIDS in 2012, that was 1.6 million people died from HIV in 2012. So if we take 1.2 million and we divide that by 34 million, we look at about a 3.5% annual mortality rate of HIV AIDS. If we look at how many people have died since this epidemic first began, we have about 36 million people globally have died. And if we look at what countries are more heavily hit, overwhelmingly developing countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have the highest concentrations of HIV AIDS. 
So if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa over here, 25 million people are estimated to have HIV AIDS or HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. If we look at North America as a whole, as an entire continent, we have 1.3 million people estimated to have AIDS. So in terms of how many people are estimated to have it in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's almost 20 times more people in Sub-Saharan Africa that are estimated to have HIV compared to North America. So the concentration of HIV is much higher in Africa, particularly when you factor into account that the overall net population in Africa is lower compared to North America. So if we look at how many people are living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have 25 million and most of the new cases are believed to occur in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then if we look at North America as a whole, we have about 1.3 million people living with HIV in North America, and of those, we are having an estimated 48,000 new infections annually of HIV in North America and 52,000 deaths from HIV AIDS. So in other words, the rate of infection is outpacing the rate of death. In other words, it's spreading right now. If someone becomes infected with HIV, there's going to be multiple stages to the infection. The very first stage is the acute state, or the acute phase where they're asymptomatic but highly infectious. They don't have necessarily any of the symptoms related to HIV and one, because they don't necessarily have the symptoms, they don't realize that they have it and they're much more likely to spread it. There is a special kind of white blood cell that expresses a protein known as CD4. And these individuals that have just contracted HIV will have a CD4 white blood cell count above 500 cells per cubic millimeter of blood. Or, let's see here. Now, if we look at the next stage of HIV infection, this is the category B or the chronic phase. This is the phase that lasts for years, months to years. These are people that are going to start to develop some of the symptoms of HIV. And particularly, their white blood cell count, their CD4 white blood cell count, is going to drop below that 500 cells per cubic millimeter threshold. And then finally, if their white CD4 white blood cell or leukocyte count drops below 200 cells per cubic millimeter of blood, then they have AIDS. So now at this point, their CD4 count, white blood cell count is so low, they can no longer effectively fight off other infections. And now they're going to have many opportunistic infections in their bodies. So we have that category A, the acute phase. During that acute phase, the HIV viron reproduces very, very, very rapidly and will start killing off many, many, many of the CD4 T lymphocytes. But then we start to fight off HIV. We start to produce antibodies that can combat HIV. And the HIV population in our, our count in our blood drops way down. The problem is HIV will start to mutate and change and adapt to our immune system and continue to fight off and destroy our CD4 T lymphocytes. These are also commonly referred to as the T helper cells. If you think back to earlier when we talked about the immune system. And those T helper cells are like the coordinators of, or quarterbacks of our immune system. Then we have the chronic phase. During that chronic phase, we are going to find that the CD4 T lymphocyte count drops below 500 cells per cubic millimeter of blood. And then finally, once the count drops below 200 cubic millimeter or 200 CD4 positive T lymphocytes per cubic millimeter of blood, once we drop below that 200 cell threshold, we are now are going to be categorized as acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. The immune system is officially impaired. We do not have enough CD4 lymphocytes to accurately or effectively fight off infection and the HIV viron particle concentration skyrocket again. If we look at the structure of HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, it is a double, it has two single strands of RNA to encode its genetic information. And this RNA is single stranded, which means it has a very high mutation rate. There's also some special envelopes or spikes on its surface. Those spikes have a special protein known as GP120. So the special protein on the surface of HIV is GP120, and this GP120 protein is what specifically allows HIV viron particles to target CD4 positive lymphocytes. Within HIV, there are three enzymes. One is reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase takes RNA 
and turns it into DNA. We have integrase. Integrase will take the genetic information from HIV and incorporate it or integrate it into the host cell genome. And then we have protease. This protease is a special enzyme that will help to digest proteins within the host cell. As HIV is attacking a host cell, the very first thing it needs to do is attach to the outside of the host cell. It will attach to the outside of the host cell with those protein spikes, the GP120 spikes, that bind specifically to the CD4 receptors on the host cell. After attaching, the HIV viron cell fuses with the membrane of the host cell and will enter the host cell. During entry, the ribonucleic acids, those two single-stranded pieces of RNA, are going to be dumped into the cytoplasm of the host cell. And then reverse transcriptase from the HIV viron particle will take the RNA that was added to the cytoplasm and turn that RNA into double-stranded DNA. Normally, when we go through the process of transcription, we go from DNA double-stranded DNA, single-stranded messenger RNA. But reverse transcription, uh, done by reverse transcriptase, takes that single-stranded RNA and goes backwards to make a double-stranded piece of DNA. And then finally, we have integration. Once we have that new DNA made, that new DNA is going to be incorporated into the host cell's nucleus, and it, that is known as a provirus. It's a precursor to the virus. And once we have integration occur, it's very, very difficult to root out and destroy all the HIV virons because those, the genetic code of HIV is now camouflaged and hidden in our own genetic code. After um, integration has occurred, we're now going to, or the host cell will now start to produce viral RNA molecules and viral protein molecules. These viral RNAs and viral proteins will then be assembled within the cytoplasm of the cell, host cell into new viron particles. These new viron particles bud out from the host cell membrane, and as they bud out from the host cell membrane, they will take phospholipids from that host cell membrane, turning them into the cell, their envelope. And then finally, during transmission, the new viron particle will infect a new host cell. So to summarize this process, we have attachment. It first attaches, it fuses and enters. The viral RNA is turned into DNA, or copied DNA, or uh, double-stranded DNA, which is then integrated into the host cell genome. After integration, that Viral genetic material is then used to make messenger RNA. The messenger RNA binds to ribosomes, and viral proteins are made that are then assembled to make uh, viron particles that bud out. And at, during that budding process, they'll take part of the blue cell membrane with them and turn those phospholipids into the viral envelope. Now let's talk about some of the epidemiology of HIV, how it spreads. Um, we can spread HIV through sexual contact. That is the single largest or single most common source of spreading it. But it also can be spread through dirty needles if someone is an injection drug user, through blood transfusions, or from a mother to an infant, from baby to mother, or from mom to baby. Globally, um, the single biggest cause of HIV spreading is heterosexual sex. Um, particularly, if you look in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are um, many, many people in Sub-Saharan Africa that have HIV AIDS. And there are certain cultural practices in that region that help cause it to spread so rapidly. For one, it's socially um, acceptable or very common at the very least to have for men to have multiple, multiple sexual partners at the same time and for women to also have multiple sexual partners at the same time. So you can imagine the rate of transmission of any sexually um, based disease in those cultures where it's okay or where it's common to have multiple sexual partners is going to be very rapid and very fast. There are also some more rural places in Africa where it's believed that if a male has intercourse with a virgin female, that that male will be cured of HIV AIDS. And this is not the case, but actually serves to infect yet another person with HIV AIDS. Now, most of you are probably going to be living and working in the United States if you're taking this course. So let's talk about what, how the most common modes of transmission in the United States. According to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control this website, the most common method of transmission of HIV in the United States is homosexual male sex, or men who have sex with men, the MSM, which you can see in this category. Now, uh, 2014 is the most recent data that I can find. 
Oh, it was shown on this graph, and I pulled this from a report that was published in 2015. In 2015, if we look at instances of men having sex with men, men having sex with men, um, let's see, 11,000 plus 9,000 plus 7,000. Um, there were approximately 27,000 new cases of HIV in the United States that have been attributed to men having sex with men in the year 2014. And if we look at heterosexual contact, there was 4,000 plus 2,000 plus 1,000 plus 1,000. There were an estimated 8,000-ish new cases of HIV in the United States due to heterosexual contact. What can we glean from this? Well, first we can glean that this disease does not discriminate based on sexual orientation. Both heterosexual and homosexual individuals can transmit and contract this disease. But what we can also glean from this graph is that within the United States, there's, um, if someone falls into a specific demographic, if they are an individual, a male that has sex with male, they're another male, they are much more likely to have contracted HIV compared to someone who does not fall into that demographic category. So if we look at how we can spread HIV. Casual contact does not spread it. And what do I mean by casual contact? I mean holding hands, brushing up against somebody. Uh, um, if you have intact skin come in contact with intact skin, you are not going to spread this disease. Now, how can we prevent the spread of this disease? Well, first of all, you could just not have sex. Abstinence is a 100% guaranteed method for preventing the spread of this disease. So if you are really worried about contracting HIV, you could just never have sex with anybody and you'll never contract, well, you won't contract this disease via sex. Now, let's say you're somebody who doesn't want to contract the disease, but you still want to have a sex life. If you have sex with only somebody who is uninfected, so you're monogamous with an uninfected sexual partner, regardless of sexual orientation, you will not be able, and that partner, I should say, is also monogamous, then you will not contract the disease. Or if you have proper and consistent use of a barrier, such as a condom, you will not contract the disease. Now, there's a big caveat, proper and consistent. Most people that are sexually active won't have a condom available with them every single time that they're in the mood. So relying on condoms is effective, but not foolproof. So let's look at HIV testing and treatment now. HIV testings are, tests are primarily going to be looking at for the looking for the antibodies that attach or attack the virus as opposed to the virus itself. So these are going to be an immunologic based test and that they look for the antibodies for the virus. Most people are going to take two to eight weeks to start developing antibodies for the HIV infection, but it can take as long as six months. So when testing is done, um, if you recently had intercourse with some unprotected intercourse with someone who is suspected to be positive, you should have multiple tests done as long as, I would say, seven months after the act of intercourse, just to make sure that you aren't producing those antibodies. How can we treat HIV? Unfortunately, there is no cure, but there are antiviral drugs that can slow down and inhibit the rate of HIV replication. And each of those drugs are going to target different stages of the HIV life cycle, maybe, um, the fusion, maybe the budding, maybe the integration of the genetic code, maybe they'll target reverse transcription of the genome from RNA to DNA. So during every step of the viral life cycle, that's going to be a new target or a potential target for an antiviral drug. There have been some vaccines studied in um, various trial settings, and it's we've had over 50 different vaccines tested and 30 therapeutic vaccines also tested. So the preventative vaccines are vaccines that would hopefully prevent you from ever contracting it. And the therapeutic vaccines are a vaccine you would take after you've contracted HIV. Unfortunately, since this virus is single-stranded RNA based, it has an incredibly high rate of mutation. And this means that no, rate, no vaccine has ever been 100% effective. Also, from region to region and across the globe and from one point in time to another point in time, HIV viruses have very different genomes. They're constantly mutating their genomes. And these vaccines are only going to give us very short-term protection against the viron particle. 
It's also concerned that this vaccine can increase the chances of you contracting the disease or even um, causing the disease itself, depending on what kind of vaccine it's used. If we use a um, weakened or deactivated Viron vaccine, there are some very legitimate concerns associated with those particular kinds of vaccines. If we look at HIV, HIV, this virus, will insert its genetic material into the human cell, and it makes it so that we can't find the genetic material for the virus within our own bodies because the viral genome can hide inside of the nucleus of our own cells and will elude our immune system for months at a time to reemerge later slightly mutated. Also, another barrier to research is there's no ideal animal model for testing against HIV AIDS treatments, which means the best way to test treatments are in human beings. And I don't know about you, but I am definitely not going to volunteer for a clinical trial on a preventative vaccine for HIV AIDS. I'm just not interested in it. So class, concept check. Which of the following is not a way of preventing or reducing the spread of HIV AIDS? We have A, abstinence, B, birth control pills, C, monogamy with an uninfected partner who is also monogamous with you, I should add. And then D, consistent condom use. If you don't know the answer, that is A-OK. -okay. Go ahead and rewind the video, or you can check your notes or your textbook. Please go ahead and pause it and then get me an answer. Five, four, three, two, one. The correct answer to this question is B, birth control pills. If someone is taking birth control pills, it offers zero protection against trans or contracting HIV AIDS from sexual intercourse. Not having sex is a great way to avoid getting this sexually based disease. Or if you only have sex with somebody who doesn't have the disease and is only having sex with you, you can avoid getting the disease. Or if you have consistent and proper use of a barrier, if you consistently use that condom, you can also reduce the chances of contracting the disease. And that's all we have for this recording. Uh, we'll pick up with tuberculosis in our next recording. If you have any questions, please go ahead and post them on the class discussion board or shoot me an email or swing by my office when you're on campus. Happy studies.